Buen día, les habla Pedro, el autor de La Cadena, tu medio independiente sobre criptomonedas y educación financiera. Para esta edición tuve el honor de entrevistar a uno de los más grandes referentes del criptoespacio, Andreas M. Antonopoulos. Él ha escrito cinco libros sobre Bitcoin y blockchain, dedicando los últimos 10 años de su vida a educar sobre estos temas. Aviso que la entrevista va en inglés porque Andreas no habla español. Así que ojalá la disfruten y pasemos a escuchar lo que dice. But would you mind giving us a little bit of your background just so that we can get an idea or my readers can get an idea more of where you come from and what you were doing before getting involved in crypto? So I'm a computer geek. I got my first um, computer at age 10. I fell in love with computers. I've spent my entire life working and studying and loving computers. And um, at a very young age, I got onto the internet before a lot of other people in 1989. Um, and then I went to university in London to study computer science and specialized in internet technologies and got my master's degree in 1994 on networks and distributed systems, which basically is the internet. Um, so in 1994, not many people with a master's degree in the internet. Uh, and I then started focusing a lot on information security. And I was fascinated by the use of cryptography to do things in society uh, through a movement at the time uh, called the cypherpunk movement, which involved as well as early attempts to make money based on cryptography, the very first cryptocurrencies. I then heard about it in sometime in 2011 and ignored it. And then I heard about it again sometime in 2012. And this time I read the white paper and I paid attention and it, it caught my attention so hard that I spent several months, uh, I basically dropped everything else that I was doing. And I spent four months um, reading, writing, coding, and learning about Bitcoin 16 hours a day, forgetting to eat, forgetting to sleep, forgetting to do everything. And emerged from that, having persuaded myself that I could not find a way to break this. I could not find a catch. I could not find a flaw to this system. I tried really hard to find why it wouldn't work. And then I focused my career and attention 100% on Bitcoin. And that's, that's how the story begins. Uh, so as of the middle of 2012, I dropped everything else, switched to focusing entirely on Bitcoin and have never turned back. Um, published my first book in 2014. Uh, mastering Bitcoin, um, and yeah, and I'm I'm now working on my sixth book in the space. So I'm a computer scientist. Um, my focus is on explaining technology in simple to understand terms, um, and that's the role I've taken in the Bitcoin and open blockchain space in the crypto space as um, a teacher, a relatively neutral academic style teacher, trying to teach in very simple terms that everyone can understand what this technology is, but also what its social, economic, and political implications are. And um, that's, that's what I do. Fascinating. And thinking, thinking along those lines, um, given that you're mostly nowadays, I guess, an educator. I suppose you haven't left behind your coding or programming or anything like that, but thinking as an educator and dedicating yourself to that aspect of the technology, what would you tell somebody who's just starting to get involved in the crypto space and is just learning about the technology, is a bit skeptical, and is just trying to understand the first aspects of it? Well, um, first of all, Uh, I think it's it's important to look at this as a technology and not only as an investment. I think if you look at it primarily or only as an investment, you're missing a big part of this. Um, just like if you were looking at 
the internet in the 90s and you thought, oh, this could, you know, let me buy some Yahoo stock. This is going to be huge. Uh, you would be missing the point. Um, the same thing applies today. And of course, it's harder to do that with crypto because currency is uh, or money is an integral component of how this technology works. It is a money technology, um, first and foremost. But technology is the key word there, not money. And understanding it as a revolutionary technology of money is more important than understanding it as a revolutionary money. Right, exactly. I, I couldn't agree more that I think the focus is also should be first and foremost on the technology. And then if you want to think of it as an investment later on, but I, I, I totally agree. And what, yeah. do you, what would you say is the primary appeal that cryptocurrency might have for somebody? Why do you think that this might be appealing to somebody, say, if in South America or in Central America? I think there's really two ways of looking at this. One, uh, what appealed to me is the geek perspective, right? Uh, I love technology for the elegance of the technology itself as a, as a pure artifact of human civilization, as a mathematical system, as a, a, a technology, Bitcoin and everything that it spawned after is elegant. It's beautiful. Um, and some people, they look at a mathematical equation or a piece of code or a software architecture, and they say that is beautiful. Um, and not many people like that. I understand. It's a bit weird, but that's me. <laughs> so one aspect is that. Now, if you're not of that um, way, then to me, the, the, the other thing that appealed almost as strongly is the fact that this technology changes uh, a very fundamental power dynamic in society. And that power dynamic is control over the production and access to money in general, financial systems, economies, et cetera. Uh, and I find that the world operates on systems that are profoundly unfair and that are profoundly limited and um, push billions of people into poverty because they do not give them access to the same level uh, as others. They don't give them access to the same tools because access to the machinery of money, the financial tools, the economic tools, access to the world economy is very carefully controlled. What appeals to me about Bitcoin is that no one can control access to the economy and the money of Bitcoin. It is the first open system of money that we have had in more than a hundred years. So the, the previous open system of money that we had um, was gold coins, um, which you could own and nobody knows who you are or what you're doing with them or who you're giving them to and no one can stop you from owning a gold coin. And we had that for thousands of years. Um, and since the 1930s and until today, over 100 years, we've gone into a system of money that is closed, where, uh, the, the, where 85 percent or more of the human population do not have access to stable money or democratic open governments or both. And Bitcoin is a form of stable money that encourages democratic access. It is open to everyone, everywhere in the world, without anyone being able to control or prevent you from accessing it. And that is both taking us back to the past where we had open money, 
but it's taking us forward because this form of open money is global, instantaneous, digital, and very, very secure. Um, so calling it digital gold uh, is, a, is a very good metaphor because you get the open access that you would have if you used gold coins as your currency uh, that no one can stop you from owning or using. And that as a digital format. Um, and I think when people hear the term digital gold, they think only of gold in a, in a vault, mm. as in large amounts of gold that a government has. But when I think of digital gold, I also think of a tiny gold coin held by a merchant in a market stall in Morocco at the end of the Silk Road, buying mm. and selling spices from an Indian or Chinese merchant who has traveled down the Silk Road. Um, that's also gold, gold for trade, gold for medium of exchange. Um, we did have that. Anyway, I don't want to go too long on this point. But yes, so what excites me about Bitcoin, apart from the pure beauty of the technology, is the possibility of an open world economy that everyone can participate in and no one can prevent others from participating in. Um, I want to I want to ask you something that pertains directly to Chile, which is where the majority of my subscribers are based. And about mm -hmm. a year and a half ago, we had Chile as a whole erupted in massive social protests. Um, yep. And there was there's this big grassroots movement demanding dignity, equality, economic justice. Uh, a steering away from the neoliberal experiment that we've had in place since the 70s and 80s and our dictatorship under Pinochet. How would you, what role do you see crypto and Bitcoin playing as a support to those of us that went out, left our feet on the street, really protested? And how, how does crypto really play a role in helping us advance towards a more fair and just society here in Chile. Yeah, I mean, I've I've visited Chile in the past, and um, I I got to see the the two aspects of um, of Chile, the Zurich of South America on the one hand, mm -hmm. gleaming towers of glass and steel, right, and, and then simultaneously a bit further from the center of town, uh, <laughs> I, I got to see, in Santiago, I got to see, you know, um, quite severe poverty. And, um, you know, as you said, Chile, Chile is, has been the laboratory of neoliberalism where the worst kinds of experiments can be executed um, and then those that are successful are imported into the United States um, mm. and vice versa, right? We take the worst of American politics and we export them to Chile and we take the worst experiments and impose them on Chile first. Um, and it's really sad to see. T to me, I think the ability to control a country through um, and, and to maintain this kind of neoliberal um, politics of extreme wealth inequality, but also extreme inequality of opportunity. Um, you need to have control over the money. It, that's a very important piece of the puzzle. So, um, because control over the money, control over the guns, control over the cops, control over the streets all go hand in hand. And so uh, the reason I think it's important important for um, people in countries like that is because I think that taking away control of the money or taking yourself outside of that control um, is a very powerful thing to do. It allows people to exit the system, to opt out without leaving the country, 
um, without have to having to fight for control over the streets or having to fight control over the military or control over the police or control over the government system, but instead simply exiting the, the monetary system, which does two things. And I think it's important for people to see this. When you start operating inside a crypto economy, not only do you um, exit the national system and become part of something new, not only do you get to enjoy being part of a different economy where the control of the system doesn't impact you as much, your money can't be inflated to shit, your bank account can't be frozen because you went to a protest, your political opposition party can't get defunded or blackmailed or uh, whatever because uh, the banking system can't put an embargo on you. Um, not only do you effectively exit the, the prison of the monetary system, but even better, you also remove your creative contribution from that system. So not only are you outside it so it can't control you, you're also taking away your consent, your passion, creativity, contribution, labor, time, and effort from that system. Uh, and, you know, surely that won't matter. But if enough people do it, it does matter. It absolutely matters. Uh, if enough people do that, you pull the rug from under that system. Um, neoliberalism depends on income redistribution in the opposite direction. It depends <laughs> on um, taxing the middle and lower classes through inflation and uh, tariffs and um, stripping out the institutions of social support and feeding all of that money up to the upper class of investors and owners and landlords and um, media moguls and industrialists uh, through corporate subsidies. It's inverse socialism. It is socialism for the rich um, with rugged capitalism for the poor. Well, you know, if you withdraw your financial consent from that system, you starve it. So, yeah, I think it's a very powerful force. Um, it gives you back control over your own wealth, but it also takes away your contribution to their wealth. Perfect. Um, and how do you see cryptocurrency and Bitcoin in five years? And what, what do you, because I know that mass adoption, the term or concept mass adoption gets thrown out a lot, but what does that look like to you? What would mass adoption look like? So I don't think mass adoption is the goal. If by what we define as mass adoption, it, it depends on who you define as mass. Mm -hmm. um, and to that, I will quote Alex Gladstein, who's done a lot of work in this place. Um, you know, 13% of humans live in a liberal democracy with a strong or reserve currency and 87% live in either an illiberal uh, government or a shitty currency or both. Who's the mass? A lot of the people who say mass adoption, what they imagine is, um, you know, uh, Karen and uh, David <laughs> going to Starbucks and using Bitcoin to buy their latte. Um, but that's not the mass. That's the 13% who already have access to reserve currency and um, strong liberal democracy. The mass is the 87% who have been left outside of that system, who either have no voice or have no pocket or both. And, um, and so from, from that perspective, to me, mass adoption is uh, giving access to financial systems to everyone on the planet who needs and wants them. I talk about this in, by using the term universal access to basic finance, not universal basic income, although that might be part of it, but universal access to basic financial tools. 
Um, and to me, that is success for this new economic system. And it's already happening in pockets where needed. Um, it is happening already. So where do we go in five years? We make it easier, uh, we make it more secure, and we make it harder to stop so that more people can gain access to it. And right now, the barriers to access are not financial. It's not because, well, some of it is financial, um, but uh, it's not because people can't afford to buy a Bitcoin because nobody's going to be buying a Bitcoin. Mm. Um, the affordability of transaction fees is certainly a concern, but we're beginning to address that with the Lightning Network and other technologies. The primary barriers right now are financial literacy, technological literacy, access to technology infrastructure, and making the system easy enough to use so that people can use it. So for me, mainstream access means having a cheap enough Android phone with a with a good enough data connection and good enough software that people can start using Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies um, to gain universal access to finance. Perfect, perfect. Um, something that my subscribers actually ask me a lot, and I usually don't, I mostly focus also, although I'm non-technical, I focus on the technology, on educating the technology, and I kind of step away from the finance and the investment part. But I asked subs my subscribers if there was anything in particular that they wanted to ask you. And amongst one of the questions that was most asked is, do you think that crypto and the crypto market, and I guess the broader economy in general, or as in stock market assets, stuff like that, is in a bubble? Yes. Simple answer. <laughs> yes. Um, crypto is in a bubble, but everything is in a bubble. And in fact, the crypto bubble is, is fed more by the everything bubble. Because everything is in a bubble, it's almost impossible for investors to get a return. And because they're dealing in inflationary money, which means that it is sinking in front of their eyes. The value of their money is sinking in front of their eyes by at least 3% a year, in many cases, 10% or more. Investors are desperate to shore up their investments. So they've blown a bubble into everything. And the, the more cheap money we have, the more the everything bubble inflates. Well, eventually some of that spilled over into crypto and started blowing a bubble there, just like every other asset class. Uh, the only difference is this is a bubble that anyone can participate in, whereas all of the other bubbles are exclusive. Um, the average person doesn't get to participate in the NASDAQ bubble, in the municipal bond bubble, in the startup bubble, in the tech fangs bubble, in the bonds bubble, in the currency bubble. No, they are either victims of those things, uh, for example, in the currency devaluation, or uh, they're simply outsiders. Uh, so all they get to see is the healthcare cost bubble, the bread and milk bubble, the meat bubble, the transportation cost bubble. They get to be in the uh, bubble of prices, not the bubble of assets, right? right. Um, one of the things about crypto is that it's, it's a bubble everyone can participate in. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean it's a smart investment right now. It might be, it might not be. I can't predict that. The thing about bubbles is that knowing you're in a bubble doesn't really help. It doesn't provide you with the most important answer, which is what to do next. You can be in a bubble and if the bubble lasts another three years and goes another five times over, then your best option is to stay in it. Um, or it could be crashing tomorrow and then your best option is to get the hell out. 
or you might not have anywhere else to put your assets, in which case, what's the difference between this bubble and that bubble other than this one's done better? Uh, <laughs> so all of those are things that are, they make, they make the, let me put it a different way. The entire world economy presents a tremendous challenge for everyone right now. Um, but much more so for those who cannot participate in every aspect of it. So yes, crypto is in a bubble, um, but unfortunately that doesn't help us because if you take your money out of crypto and put it somewhere else, you're also in a bubble, just in a less accessible bubble and less successful bubble. Um, so this is the, the biggest challenge, I think, that investors, old investors or new investors are facing today. Um, I'll tell you what's not in a bubble. Uh, education is not in a bubble. Not the cost of acquiring it, but today you can acquire an education using free resources with a minimum, minimal investment. You know, you can invest $20 a month to get a basic data connection on your smartphone or uh, internet at home, which because it becomes your school, your university, your um, entertainment, your news source, et cetera, actually is affordable to a much bigger range of people. Um, you can get a, an education um, a quality education at much lower cost than you could ever get before. And that's not in a bubble. Those skills are important. And that's why I say, you know, if you're trying to decide if you should or shouldn't invest in Bitcoin, you should be thinking instead about whether you should educate yourself about this technology. Uh, and that investment, does, you don't need to time it. It doesn't expire. It's not volatile. And the underlying cost is low. Um, even if you don't have access to the internet, it's it's a lot cheaper to buy a smartphone and a data connection than a seat in a university. Yeah, exactly. I couldn't agree more. And that's why my primary focus is mostly on the education bit and not necessarily the investment side. Um, right. You touched on something before, I guess, about the devaluation of money and, well, the ownership of money. And yep. we've been seeing the, there's, I, I, I think we're definitely going to see, or we will see in the future, a battle for the monetary structure of mm -hmm. money, which will be, I guess, on one side, Bitcoin and open blockchains, then we'll have corporate currencies from Facebook. We don't know if Apple will come along or Amazon. And then we have central bank digital currencies, which will, will also yep. be striving for that control. What do you think yep. people should be aware of uh, when looking at these three technologies? And why should people, in your eyes, tend to focus towards crypto or choose crypto? Now, this is a great question. In fact, it's going to be the topic of my next um, talk that I'm <laughs> doing, I think. I think this weekend, um, Great. which is about the, the currency wars, the sequel, um, revenge of the central banks or some silly topic title like mm -hmm. that. Um, I did a talk before called currency wars, which predicted this four years ago. And that was about how the the cycle we're in at the moment is is clearly unsustainable and will come to a head and uh, one of the things that we're going to start seeing is governments are going to need to find someone to blame when things go to shit and bitcoin makes an excellent target for that although now facebook is also pr providing a fantastic target especially if they actually launch libra or diem uh, I hope they do, because then they'll be a better target than Bitcoin when things turn to mm -hmm. shit. Everyone will be like, Facebook ruined the economy <laughs> with their currency. Right now, in a lot of countries, we're going to see a move to say digital currencies are what is breaking our economy. They're beginning to say that in Nigeria. They're beginning to say that in India. 
they're going to blame crypto for breaking their own currencies. Um, and the analogy I use is um, blaming the lifeboats for sinking the Titanic. It's <laughs> like if you all had stayed, and this is what I'm going to use in my talk, but if you all had stayed on board with your life jackets, we would be floating. Uh, but it's because you all left and got in the lifeboats without our permission that the ship sunk. You removed your buoyancy from the system. You didn't allow yourselves to be taken hostage to a sinking ship. And it's actually your fault for getting into the lifeboats, right? Um, this is absolutely what's going to happen next. It's important to realize that um, these three categories of currency present completely different perspectives of what money is and who it's for. National money is money of the government, by the government, but ultimately for the government and those who are friends of the government. Corporate currency is money by corporations, of corporations, and ultimately for the benefit of corporations. Money of the people, by the people, and for the people. It is the humanistic currency. And that difference is going to become stark because you can pretend that a central bank digital currency is just a cryptocurrency. You can pretend that Libra is a cryptocurrency or DM or whatever they're calling it now. You can pretend that all of these things are one and the same and indistinguishable. And got, they're going to try to blur the lines. This is why they're using the terms digital currency. Because digital currency is not what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin isn't digital currency. We already have digital currency. 92% uh, of the US dollars in circulation are digital currency. There are numbers in databases and banks. They do not exist as physical currency. They are digital currency. They exist on wire transfer networks in the central bank databases on spreadsheets. 90% or more of every national currency is a digital currency. Bitcoin isn't a digital currency. Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. Bitcoin is a decentralized cryptocurrency. And they're going to try and blur these distinctions by, say, calling everything digital currency. But just because it's a digital currency doesn't mean it has anything in common with Bitcoin. I use an acronym to remind people why it's important, why Bitcoin is important, and why other open blockchains may also be important in the same way. Um, and that acronym is Ripcord. Ripcord is that little thing you pull on your parachute to open it after you jump out of the plane. And you want to make sure that whatever you strapped onto your back has a ripcord. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> if it's just the backpack that contains your gym clothes, you'll have a bad time on the way down. <laughs> um, so what does ripcord mean? Ripcord are the characteristics you want in these systems. So you ask the following questions. Is it revolutionary? That's what the R stands for. Is it immutable? Is it public? Is it collaborative? Is it open? Is it resistant to censorship or control? And is it decentralized? If it is all of those things, it's special. That's what makes it special. It's not the name Bitcoin. It's not the digital and digital currency or digital gold. It's not the blockchain technology because you can make centralized blockchains. It's not any of that. It's really all of the things that emerge from de decentralization. And the things that emerge that matter are revolutionary, immutable, public, collaborative, open, resistant, and decentralized. If it is those things, it is the real thing. Those properties cannot be faked. So... What are central bank digital currencies? Are they revolutionary? <laughs> Absolutely no. <laughs> they are the essence of the status quo. They are anti or counter-revolutionary, in fact. Are they immutable? Of course not. They can be changed and modified at the whim of the government. Their monetary policies, their rules, the consensus, the transactions, did the transactions happen or not? Oh, yeah, well, we undid that one. Um, are they public? Well, no, the inner workings will not be public. 
Are they collaborative? No, they're centrally managed. You do not get to participate in the consensus rules. Are they open? Absolutely not. You must be authorized to participate in them. You are not firing up some software and participating in the Indian central bank digital currency, Digi Rupee. Um, you have not been invited to that network. Are they resistant to censorship? No, in fact, censorship is an integrated feature in all of these things. They are censorship friendly. And are they decentralized? Of course not. All of the other things already prove that they are centralized. They are all about the application of centralized power, control, and surveillance. So they're not ripcord. Um, and you can do the same thing with Facebook's Libra. In fact, you can do it also with maybe 80% of the alt currencies or altcoins in the crypto space, even those don't really fulfill the ripcord principles. So when looking at the three-way battle, I've described this as a three-body problem. Three-body problem is a, is a problem in physics and mathematics about three bodies that exert gravitational pull on each other in different orbits. And it's famous because there is no, um, there is no direct solution to calculating the gravitational pull of three bodies exert on each other um, because uh, the interactions are too complex, right? Mm -hmm. So a three-body problem, and, and this is a classic three-body problem. You've got state money versus corporate money versus people's money. And it's, it's hard even to see at the very beginning who's fighting who. At, at first, you might think that the governments are mostly against people's money like Bitcoin. But what we saw is that as soon as Facebook money came along, the governments freaked out and started seeing that as a much bigger danger. And I think they're right about that. And I don't know if... but. At the same time, they can't become allies with people's money in order to find corporate money because that would see too much power. And people's money is never going to ally with either corporate or government money. And so you get this really complex interaction where it's not clear who's going to be whose enemy and who's going to pretend to be whose friend. Um, but the only clear thing I know, to me at least, is that of all of those three categories, only one has ripcord principles, which is what I care about, and only one belongs to the people. Uh, so I know what I'm backing. Now, the other things are going to be very appealing. They're going to be shiny and polished and convenient and easy and fun. And you're going to be able to get all kinds of dopamine stimulation when you're using your Libra or DM or whatever they're going to call it to play on Facebook. They're going to turn money into uh, a dop dopamine stimulating surveillance experience that is going to be so polished. Um, but ultimately, all of that is for their benefit. And um, a lot of people are gonna fall for that. The same difference between citizen journalism published independently is not the same as your Facebook feed. Um, you are not the customer of DM. You are the product that they're selling to everyone else. Your financial history is the product, the violation of your privacy, the surveillance of your financial history, just like you are not the customer of Facebook news or Facebook feeds or Facebook messenger. You are the product that they wrap, package up, dissect and sell to advertisers and surveillance uh, companies and intelligence agencies and oppressive governments, you again will not be the customer, you will be the product. You're also not the customer of central bank digital currencies, neither are you a sovereign citizen with rights within that system. Central banks, retail banks and investment banks are the customers of those systems. You are the product that keeps it alive. You feed it with your labor and they eat it. <laughs> so, so that's important to remember um, because we're approaching a time when we are going to have a battle. 
Um, and I can't tell you that we will win that battle because it's not a battle that takes place universally. Every person makes their own choice. Different places will make different choices. And there will be many people, billions perhaps, who will choose central bank digital currencies, who will choose corporate currencies. All I care about is for those who need and want, can we make sure that they can choose cryptocurrency? Exactly. Yeah. I am it's going to be a fa I also agree it's going to be a fascinating and an interesting battle that's going to play out and I as you hope that people will realize and they'll come over to our camp. <laughs> Um, well, they'll, they'll realize eventually because, simply speaking, the, the real question we have to ask is, which systems solve which problems for whom? Yeah. So if you join the central bank digital currency, which of your problems does that solve? Um, it doesn't solve inflation. Quite the opposite. It makes it worse. And in fact, it holds you hostage in a system where negative interest rates can be applied. It doesn't solve surveillance or privacy or control over your money or government corruption or um, the accumulation of power or reverse socialism for the rich and the corporations. It doesn't solve any of those things. Um, so what it solves is it solves a problem that central banks have. It solves a problem that retail investment banks have. It solves a problem that the rich have, and that is that they've squeezed the system as much as they can, and now they need a new system to squeeze more. Uh, and so eventually, if you're in that system, your account will be frozen. Your money will be devalued. Your money will be seized, stolen from you. If you object, you will be turned off as a financial participant. Uh, you will be prevented from using your money to express political power, from contributing to a political party that opposes the government. You will be prevented from using your money to do anything that goes against. Ultimately, your money only exists in the context of the whim of the current government, whatever form that government takes, right? Mm. And the moment you violate that whim, they turn you off. Uh, with Facebook, the same thing applies, only worse. Your money only exists at the whim of this intersection of your local government power and Facebook. So in order for Facebook to work, they're going to have to accept some control by local governments. So if you offend the Indian government, they'll turn off your Facebook money. But also if you offend Facebook, they'll turn off your Facebook money. So now you have two rulers and you offend either of their whims and they turn off your money. Now you have to kiss both of them, right? Um, so again, th this is about, ultimately this is about power. You get to learn the lesson that you don't have money because eventually you try to do a transaction and something weird happens and your money's frozen for two weeks because the plumber who sent it to you has a cousin who has a name that matches a Taliban leader from 1993. Mm -hmm. Who the fuck knows, right? <laughs> and and right. you have no way of predicting, right? It's the ultimate Kafka-esque nightmare. You have no way of predicting which action will put you outside of the system, which action will result in an impossible situation where your money has been turned off and you have no due process to turn it back on, right? Right. Um, so the good news is that the choice will be made obvious quickly. Um, the bad news is that as usual, the ones who will feel the, the burden of this first, will be the disadvantaged and the disempowered. Yeah. Minorities, racial minorities, political minorities, economic minorities, undocumented laborers, sex workers, the gays, the communists, the whatever is the out of fashion group. These tools are gonna to get used against them. And everybody will go along. They'll say, well, I mean, we can't have prostitutes using money. Well, we can't have communists using money. Well, we can't allow 
criminals using money. Why are they criminals? They're late on their Netflix payment. That's a crime. Oh, well, I mean, I guess that is a crime. Let's turn off their bank account. And this is the world we're going into, right? You're, you're, right. you're late on your municipal payments for garbage collection. And without due process, Facebook takes the money from your account or the central bank digital currency turns off your account. It's like, I'm sorry, until you make a payment, um, we cannot allow you to buy groceries. This is where we're going. And if it, if it happens to the disempowered first, the rest say, oh, okay, well, it's not me. It's this person. They must have done something to deserve it, right? And this is how the slippery slope works. By the time it gets to you, you know, by the time you end up in a situation like North Korea, um, you've basically gradually moved into that without noticing. Uh, uh, you know, so... Everyone gets to feel it eventually, um, and the smart ones figure it out soon and opt out. Exactly. Andreas, I, this has been enlightening and a total honor. I really want to thank you so much for taking the time to answer some of these questions. I've got like 25 more, but... <laughs> um, mm. Thank you so much for taking the time and yeah. I, I really, really appreciate it. And I'm sure the subscribers of La Cadena, which is my newsletter, will appreciate it as well. So thank you so much. It's a pleasure. We'll talk soon, I hope. Maybe we'll do this again.